now we've got a history and understanding of the standard model and its sort of basic physics, we need to start looking at things in a bit more detail. And we need to come up with a way of writing down the interactions that are allowed in the standard model in a way that we can also calculate them. And the person who came up with that was a certain Richard Feynman who came up with his famous Feynman diagrams. So let's have a look at how to draw Feynman diagrams for quantum electrodynamics, the electromagnetic force. Now, Feynman diagrams consist of lines and vertices. And for quantum electrodynamics, we have two lines. So this first one here is called a fermion line. And it represents a fermion, and fermions are leptons like the electron or muon, um, or quarks uh, such as the up, down, strange, and so on. Now, this arrow here represents the current. It is not the direction of motion. And if a, a fermion is moving in the direction of its current, then it is a particle. If it is moving in the opposite direction to its current, then it is an antiparticle. Now, the second type of line we have in QED, quantum electrodynamic diagrams, is uh, this wiggly line here, and this is the photon line. And we connect these together with vertices, right, which usually are, uh, are just shown as a, a dot, and there is a mathematical term when we draw these diagrams each one of the components contributes a mathematical term to the overall description of the process. And so that way we can actually use these diagrams to calculate the cross-sections or branching ratios that they represent. So let's have a look at a full Feynman diagram. Now here we can see the two simplest diagrams that it's possible to have in quantum electrodynamics. We have a fermion line here, in this case the electron, and on the other side we have a quark, just to show that both of these, uh, the diagram works for both of these. And then we have a vertex uh, here and a vertex here. And what these diagrams represent is an electron, in this case interacting with an electromagnetic field represented by the photon, and on the other side we have a quark interacting with an electromagnetic field. Now, the rules uh, for quantum electrodynamics are quite simple. When you have a vertex like this, you have to have a charged fermion coming in and out of the vertex for the current, that is, right? This could be, uh, for example, it could represent an electron and a positron annihilating together to form uh, a photon, um, depending on the direction of motion of the particles. But you'll see that the current, not necessarily direction of motion, but the fermion current essentially goes through the vertex. And that's a requirement. You can't have um, both lines pointing in to the vertex or both uh, arrows pointing away from the vertex. That's not allowed. So you have to have a current flowing through the vertex. And then, because it's quantum electrodynamics, the only thing we're allowed to connect to on the other side of the vertex is, in fact, a photon. So <clears throat> the same uh, thing happens here with quarks. Now, each of these lines will eventually, and we'll learn about that later, um, represent a term in a matrix element calculation that will allow us to calculate the amplitudes of the processes that the diagram represents. Um, but one of the things you should know is that each of these vertices here is essentially a coupling between an electromagnetic field and a charged particle, and so each of these vertices, since it's electromagnetism, adds a factor of alpha, the fine structure constant for the electromagnetic force, and this is approximately equal to 1 over 137. So every time you add a vertex to your diagram, 
you are reducing the, the amplitude uh, that it contributes to the overall process, you're reducing it for electromagnetism by about two orders of magnitude. And so when we're calculating, when we're calculating the probability of processes to occur, so a cross-section or branching ratio, the most important diagrams are the ones which have the fewest vertices. Now, there are going to be other diagrams that will contribute to the process, but as you add vertices, the contribution that they add to the amplitude gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So typically, uh, and particularly in this course, we're going to tend, certainly when doing calculations, we're going to tend to concentrate on what are called the leading order diagrams, and those are the diagrams um, that have the fewest number of vertices. So now we've seen the two simple cases, um, then let's actually have a look at a full process. Okay, so here we have a Feynman diagram with two vertices. We've got an electron current and a muon current coupled together by a photon in the middle. So what process does this diagram represent? Well, that is actually an interesting question. Now, by convention, we typically uh, read the flow of time in a Feynman diagram as going left to right. So time flows in this direction. Now, in that case, what it shows is we have an electron and a anti-electron, because now, of course, this um, electron is coming into this vertex, but it's moving in the opposite direction to its current, and so that makes it an antiparticle. It becomes a, an anti-electron simply because its motion is opposite to its current, and that comes about because you can treat an antiparticle uh, the same as a particle traveling uh, backwards in time. Now, of course, that's not what's actually happening, right? A antiparticle is not a particle traveling backwards in time or vice versa. We cannot send messages to the past, um, but mathematically the two are equivalent, and so that's why this uh, structure comes about, is that if you've got the current reversed, it means it's an antiparticle. So here we have um, E plus and E minus coming together. Now, this photon here does not leave the diagram. So this is what is called a propagator. And the propagator is basically any line in a Feynman diagram that, that doesn't leave the diagram. Um, it's internal to the diagram. And the, the, we'll learn about the, the special mathematical terms that we use to represent propagators. And then at the end, what we have is, of course, now these particles are coming out. And so we have a muon because the current's in the same direction. We're moving away from this vertex. And here we have a muon whose current's in the opposite direction. So it's an anti-muon. And so what we've got is we've got a process of uh, E plus, E minus annihilation to muon, anti-muon pair. But this same diagram can be reinterpreted differently. If I draw the arrow of time up here, then I now have an arrow of time going up here, and this represents a different process, because now we have a muon coming in with its current in the same direction as motion, and an electron current in the same direction as motion. They exchange a photon, and so they're essentially scattering it off each other. So if I was to write this process down, it would be uh, electron-muon scattering. And if I was to draw the Feynman diagram in the uh, usual sense, it would look something like this, with apologies for my artwork, right, where we have the two fermion lines, and this would be an electron line, this is an electron line, this is a muon line, this is a muon line, and this horrible thing in the middle is our photon. And so that would be the normal way you would draw this process, but you can, it's obviously the same diagram, you're just interpreting it with a different direction of time. And it doesn't stop there. I can completely reverse the arrow of time and look at it going in this direction. And when I do that, I've now got a muon-antimuon pair coming in and an electron-positron pair coming out. And so now what I've got is I've got 
the sort of thing that might happen uh, at a hypothetical muon collider where I have a muon antimuon annihilating to produce an electron positron pair. And lastly, I can draw the arrow of time in this direction. And in this case, the diagram now represents, well, now I've got coming down, so my electron is moving in the opposite direction to its current, so it's an anti-electron, a positron, and this is an anti-muon. So in this case, what I've got is I've got um, E plus and mu plus scattering off each other uh, through exchange of a photon. So the same diagram represents four different processes simply based on how you define the arrow of time. And by convention, we typically go left to right to make it easy. Um, however, that's not a requirement, right? And, and the same diagram will work for all four of these processes. Obviously, there's going to be a difference with the initial conditions. In this case, if you've got an electron-positron collider, you'll have particular momentum for the electron and the positron. And what you'll want to calculate is the momenta distribution of the outgoing uh, muon-antimuon pair. If you've got an electron and a muon scattering off each other, obviously you'll have initial momenta for these two lines, because this is your initial state, and you'll be wanting to calculate the momenta uh, for the outgoing lines. And so <clears throat> all four of these processes are represented by exactly the same Feynman diagram. So the last thing um, I want to mention uh, about uh, Feynman diagrams is that for any particular process, there's an infinite number of them. And what we're doing here is we're essentially using perturbation theory. So every time we add vertices, as we discussed, we are reducing the amplitude of the diagram. However, there are an infinite number of diagrams for any given process. So here we have the process E plus and E minus goes to mu plus and mu minus, the same one we were just looking at. But I can expand this diagram. For example, I can add a photon line, and this is going to look awful, um, going between here and here. So this is a photon. Now, I haven't changed the initial or final states. I'm starting with E plus E minus. I'm ending up with mu plus mu minus. However, I've added another photon propagator term. And that will make a difference. That will have a different amplitude to the amplitude of the diagram without this term. I could you know, add another photon line here, for example, right? I could even connect between, um, between the electron and the muon lines. And I can keep adding these as much as I like. And every time I do that, though, of course, I'm adding in more and more vertices. And so it's going to have a smaller and smaller amplitude. But it's always worth remembering that a Feynman diagram is not a complete representation of the process. It is just one way in which the fields can interact to produce the um, reaction that you're looking for. There are actually an infinite number of different ways that the fields can interact to produce your combination. But as the diagrams get more and more complicated, their contributions get smaller and smaller and smaller. And how far you need to go down the infinite series of Feynman diagrams simply depends on how accurate you need your calculation to be. So now we've seen how to draw Feynman diagrams, we can use these to construct any electromagnetic interaction between any charged particles, leptons or quarks. However, obviously the standard model contains more interactions than just the electromagnetic interaction, and in the next video we'll have a look at how to draw Feynman diagrams for quantum chromodynamics, the strong nuclear force. Thank you.